that everyone um, admitted to prefer. OK, thank you. So, um, uh, Borida, Paub, um, Twitwe, Dwi'n Gweithio and Echo Odraith, Vel ITA. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Trigva Rees, and I'm an international trade advisor for Welsh Government. Uh, thank you to all who joined this morning. Croeso uh, Paub, Suedi Amino, at a session, Borema. Uh, and I'm glad to assist my colleague, Nick, in hosting this webinar on Australia and a, a section on free trade agreements. Um, we will be having a presentation from our colleague Hugh Roberts, who's an expert on free trade towards the latter half. So thank you, Nick, for just putting up the housekeeping there, which is just reminding people if they will put their mics on mute and um, switch your cameras off. But that's preference, of course, please, if you've got the bandwidth, carry on. Uh, and to let everybody know, the session will be recorded. So um, what have I got to contribute to this morning? Um, uh, what I have experience of uh, as a shipbroker in a previous role, um, I was aware of unique characteristics of the Australian market, um, in particular vessels with nuclear power couldn't berth in Australian ports. And in addition, the health and safety rules on ships' ladders meant many of the world's merchant fleet could not dock. Um, which I think is a sign of the strength of union labour at the time. Um, but the point is Australia has applied restrictive practices to trade, um, however nuanced in the past. Um, but here today we'll find out more about how we can enter the market. Uh, I wanted to check a few headlines on Australian trade. Um, and I think it comes as no surprise that we share a common language and, and a similar culture with Australia and thankfully business and legal practices and IP are broadly similar. So it makes it an ideal test market for us. In addition, the market's about 25 million, but there are a million Brits who live and work there, which is potentially an advantage. And it means you can perhaps develop new products and services and test them in a, a safer, less aggressive environment. And three fifths of Australia's population live in the four, four largest cities. So um, the ability to test the market is on offer. Um, top five UK goods exported to Australia last year. Uh, pharma is huge. Um, and about half that size is consumer goods. And then in between, you've got car vehicles, machinery, and Prize maybe beverages. Um, an important part of Australian market is their product standards approach. Um, they do adopt international standards where possible, um, though there are some unique standards to Australia, which obviously would be essential to know ahead of time. Um, packaging is something that um, is again slightly unique to Australia in, in, in some environments, um, particularly for chemicals, cosmetics, electronic goods. And perhaps to speak to something quite current at the moment, just so that everybody is there. Uh, if you are exporting to Australia, then uh, when you declare your goods weight and size, you must use the metric system. So on that point, I will now hand over to our colleague at uh, IBDG, Terry Potter. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Trig. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session on developing business in Australia. Uh, my name is Terry Potter, and our company, IBDG, has been working with the Welsh Government for over 20 years now. Um, we work with Welsh companies closely on many different um, export promotion programmes such as ITD and ITO, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And we'll be managing the forthcoming virtual trade mission to Australia um, on behalf of the Welsh Government. Today, we hope to give you some insight into the Australian market and enough information for you to decide if it's a market you'd like to explore further. 
I'm going to hand over to Amanda Hodges in a moment, um, who will deliver our presentation. Uh, just for background, um, Amanda is an international business, trade and investment advisor and business owner in both Australia and the UAE. She has over 20 years of experience advising Australian companies on export and market access and foreign companies planning to enter the Australian market. Amanda has held um, several senior executive positions with Australia's Trade Promotion Agency, Austrade, and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as a trade and commercial diplomat in Europe, Asia, the US, Middle East and India. And she's worked across a wide range of industries um, from mining and energy to infrastructure, tech, health and medical and agribusiness. Later, um, we will have a short case study from Steve Warnham of Road Safety Designs based in Panath, who will talk about his company's experience of developing business in Australia. So I hope you all enjoy the session today and I'd like to hand over to Amanda now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, ready for the first slide. Thanks, Nick. And um, it's a real pleasure. Um, thank you very much, Terry, for the introduction. And, and thank you to the Welsh Government for taking the initiative to explore the Australian market. I think we've got some good reason to, with the recent uh, signing of the free trade agreement between Australia and the UK um, last year. So maybe a chance to, to um, rediscover it if you haven't already. So my presentation, I'll just kick off with um, some points which have already fortunately been made by Trig, which is that, you know, Australian Wales really, why Welsh companies should really consider Australia. So um, as, as mentioned, Australian Wales operate with similar business, legal and regulatory frameworks, which means that there'll be a certain level of comfort um, for you as a business person when you're operating in Australia, because many of our frameworks and institutions were actually modelled on, on the UK model. There's also a high level of trust because there's been such a long history of bilateral trade, more than 200 years uh, between, between the two countries and, and investment is, is still kicking along very healthily. Uh, the other thing is Australia's economy is strong, diverse and growing. So it's coming out of the pandemic quite well, but it's also, um, it's also suffering from some of the other issues um, that other global uh, are happening around the globe, such as inflation, uh, high cost of living, is impacting on Australia as well. We've had low wage growth for some time and we're experiencing a skilled and unskilled labour shortage. So there's some of the, the challenges and things that Australian businesses and you yourselves as exporters might uh, come across when you're dealing with the Australian market. But the other, other benefit is um, the geographic location of the Australian market. So we're very close to Asia and many of our key trading partners are the North Asian markets of China, Japan and Korea. So very strong links between Australian businesses and those markets. And that could be also a useful um, point for you in terms of entering the Australian market. Many European com companies use Australia as a base for Asia. I'll just um, point out a lot of people ask me about the flags down the bottom of the page. I just sort of put them up there for a bit of a uh, info. Obviously, you might recognise the Australian one and you may know the Aboriginal flag, but many people ask me, what is the blue and green one? That's the Torres Strait Islander flag. So it's also presented in, in all formal uh, presentations in government uh, entities around Australia. Next slide. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. So um, the news and headlines in Australia at the moment has been the newly elected federal government. So last week, Australia changed government um, after nine years of the Liberal National Party. They've voted in the Australian Labor Party. So we have a new prime minister at the federal level, uh, Mr Anthony Albanese. He was the infrastructure minister in a previous um, Gillard government. So, so that's been a very big change in Australia. And um, one of the underpinning reasons for the change of government was um, that the Australian population said they wanted action against climate change. So that's that's very topical at the moment. Um, as you would know also, we have three levels of government in Australia, federal states and territories, which are, they're called, some are, two are called territories, but they're pretty much similar to a state. So six states and two territories. And then we have the local level of government, all potentially customers for you if you are selling into government. 
I mentioned the economy, um, where Australia is the 12th largest economy, um, seeking at about US value of US uh, $1.7 trillion. And the Reserve Bank of Australia estimate the GDP growth to continue at 4.4% uh, over this year and 2% for next year. So that's quite healthy, um, all things considered. GDP per capita is around just over 50,000 US and unemployment is, an, is at an all time low. So we, as I mentioned before, we have a very tight labour market. So many industries in agriculture and manufacturing like the meat abattoirs are having to sort of import uh, labour from the Pacific Islands and from other countries. And, um, and that's obviously didn't occur when Australia shut its borders over the past two years due to the COVID pandemic, but those borders are now lifted and, uh, and anyone can come to Australia provided that you've got a vaccination certificate. Uh, the other the other aspect about Australia is its transparency and ease of doing business. So it's ranked 14 um, from 190 companies. So if you're, for example, wanting to set up a branch office in Australia, it's a fairly or, or your own entity. It's a fairly straightforward uh, process to do that and a very quick process and, and cost effective as well. So the Australia's population is now around 25 million and much of the growth will come from migration in the future. Uh, the, the other thing about our population is it's very multicultural. So one in four people were born overseas. Um, so that's, and there's more than 200 languages spoken in Australia. So quite diverse. So it's very difficult to kind of talk a bit about some of our cultural uh, stereotypes because we just, it's so multicultural and hard to stereotype. The other fact about Australia is, that, as mentioned earlier, is that 90% of the population live within 90 kilometres of the coast, and that's the east coast. So very concentrated, although you hear a lot about the outback and Australia and agriculture, we all sit, we sit in the cities and the su suburbs, and so that makes your, uh, can, your target markets very easy to access in, in the concentrated um, uh, metropolitan areas. We're also just to give you a bit of an indication and people don't realise this until they travel through Australia is the distances. So we're as wide as the United States, so it takes five hours to fly from the east coast to the west coast of Australia. So, um, so that makes Perth a little bit inaccessible unless you've got something specific to the mining industry. Um, it, it's kind of uh, the rest of the population is on the on the east coast. So, uh, next slide. Thanks, Nick. This, uh, this just indicates the population distribution across the country and the commercial centres are, as mentioned, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth, um, depending on where you are. And, and there's, uh, yeah, next slide, thanks. So the Australian industry composition. So we're famous for what we call rocks and crops. So it's the mining industry and the agricultural industry, um, mining and energy is now pivoting away from iron ore and coal and focusing more on things like hydrogen and, uh, and LNG in particular, but also um, those industries are looking at how they can contribute to a low carbon economy. We're also very much heavily weighted on services. So international tourism, education, engineering, business services are a key component of the Australian economy. And we need, within that, um, the tech sector has flourished as well. So across all of the, um, the horizontals of finance, medical, ag, education, food, technology, you'll see hundreds of companies emerging in this space. And, and that's where Australia is sort of finding its footing internationally and with global partners. Agriculture, we continue to be um, the food basket as well for, for Asia. We produce a food for about 65 million people and many of that gets exported around the world. And manufacturing, once again, a key component of our imports is, is the inputs into that manufacturing. And with the freight, um, air and sea disruptions um, that occurred over the pandemic, Australia was really left uh, out on a limb in the sense that we weren't able to source many of those manufacturing inputs internationally as efficiently and quickly as possible. Australia lost 87% of its air freight and air uh, connections during the pandemic. So, um, but it's, it's another area, um, a key component of the economy. Next slide, thanks, Nick. So just some other uh, facts around the relationship between Australia and Wales and the UK. Um, the UK is the sixth top supplier of goods and services to Australia. 
It's Australia is the UK's 15th largest export market. It's a major investor, foreign investor in Australia, and it accounts for nearly 18% of the total foreign direct investment. So many brands uh, investment and funds are, are directed into Australia. Um, UK supplies much of the intermediate goods, consumption goods and services. And just on the UK FTA, I, I won't dwell too much on this because there's, there's a deeper dive uh, from your policy experts, is that the practical benefits for the Welsh companies of the FTA is that there's some better business visa access for UK citizens. So if you were to send an engineer or um, tech, technical person to Australia, that business visa process will be more streamlined now as a, as a result of the FTA. Um, there'll be less tariffs on goods and services, particularly goods. And there's also a streamlined um, protocols around digital trade, personal data protection, privacy and IP protection, and the use of digital customs documents that's been further streamlined. Uh, Wales, Welsh companies can also now bid for government contracts um, directly, and also um, we're working more collaboratively between our countries on regional security and access to multilateral trade agreements. Uh, next slide, thanks Nick. So these are some of the ways that you can enter the Australian market, depending on your good or service, your product. Um, there's cross-border e-commerce is open, um, either directly um, or through warehousing in Australia, be business to business or business to consumer. And Australia is like everyone in the world have adopted online purchasing and online uh, transactions very quickly. Uh, appointing an importer or distributor or agent for your product establishing directly your Australian office, branch, a sole proprietorship or a full company, uh, to partner with an Australian entity for licensing, franchising or collaboration on research and development. So Australian universities and, and uh, research institutes are very keen to always have uh, uh, industrial partners in their R&D, so that, that's a very good way to enter the market. And also through investment, through acquisition, joint venture, or as I mentioned to, before, to sell to government via tenders. So all of the federal government tenders are listed on Tender, and I can share that link with you. Um, and also each state and territory have their own tender portals where if you subscribe every day, you can see um, what goods and services they're looking for, for requests for proposals or for approach to market uh, type of projects. Next slide, thanks Nick. So the thing about the Australian business landscape, it is, it is competitive, um, it's very price conscious, and you really need to be able to articulate your point of difference clearly and well. And, and what is your competitive advantage? So um, it's a market that's very diverse and full of lots of products and services. So in terms of your initial introduction to the market, I would suggest that really honing in on that point the other fact about the market, like many developed markets, it's increasingly digitalized and tech oriented. It's very customer experienced and service is very key. So how do you follow up your goods and service that you're providing with that excellence in, in service to your customer? Uh, a digital and online presence is also vital in Australia, just to present yourself for your own credibility, but also it's helpful in marketing and communications. The other, the other aspect of Australia is for every sector, there's an industry association. So they can, by joining that or by um, in, enrolling or subscribing in their, um, their, their newsletters, you can get some very good insights into the trade issues that are going on, but also the trade events that are occurring. So um, that's a good way that you can network within your industry. The other aspect is that Australia is very transparent with relation to its um, regulations and standards, and they're fairly easy to find depending on your industry. I mentioned um, there's a high level of trust between well, Wales and Australia, based on our history, our common shared values, and, and, and you know our, our track record together. However, there's still very much a need to do your own due diligence as a business when you're entering into a business relationship, and I'll sort of underscore that one as is protecting your IP and making sure that it's registered in Australia or globally that includes Australia. The other aspect to consider is also generational differences in your target market, once again, depending on, on your business. And as I mentioned, multicultural, cross-cultural awareness is key. So many companies in Australia might have a um, Chinese, Japanese speaking procurement manager or export manager 
or international division and um, you need to maybe bear in mind um, their heritage and background and their cultural nuances in your dealings or, or business with them. As I said, we're very, very multicultural in Australia. Next slide. Thanks, Nick. So these are just a couple of points I thought I'd put down about what Australians value. They really love quality. So if you can point out the quality aspects of your good service, they'll pay more for it. They love this term value for money. Sustainability, as I mentioned, it's been core and they're very increasingly environmentally conscious. So any sustainable aspects of your good or product or how you operate your business is important in terms of your CSR strategies, for example. Innovation, um, like, like I think many countries, they love new technology. How is it optimised? How does it improve things? Um, you know, what's the point of difference around innovation and safety? So standards and, and workplace health and safety are also a critical element of any business in Australia, whether that be um, private or public sector. And I'll just put, put this in as well, directness. Australians are fairly straightforward, so this is a generalisation, but um, they can have a bit of a sarcastic, it could come off as sarcasm, but it's actually humour. Um, they'll be so direct, it might be a bit confrontational, but it's really actually shows that that level of trust and, and rapport that they're trying to build with you. So um, don't take it to heart. Uh, and the other thing I'll say about Australians is they're not great communicators. And I didn't put this in the slide, but um, it, they call it the cone of silence. So we might be far away and you might not hear from us for a long time in Australia, but they haven't forgotten you. And I think the key to developing a long distance business relationship is working out ways that you can regularly communicate, whether that's through a visit, through um, WhatsApping each other, through uh, regular online communication, scheduled online communication. I think that helps um, the tyranny of distance and the tyranny of the time difference as well, which is quite significant. So staying in touch, but the thing about Australians is they won't forget you. They might come back three months later as if it was yesterday. So it's really up to you to take that initiative and, and keep, um, keep that relationship alive. So uh, next slide, thanks Nick. So these are just a couple of resources I've listed um, from the Australian perspective on the UK FTA. Um, there's quite comprehensive information and links to harmonised tariffs and codes on this DFAT uh, website. Austrade have some very good um, market briefs and sector briefs that give a deep dive on different industry sectors. Um, customs information is with home at the Home Affairs Department. And the Forders and Customs Brokers Association have a list of all the private sector entities who are their members who could assist you with very detailed advice and information about um, the requirements for your product into the market. So I think that's my last slide, Nick. And I'll uh, on that note hand back to Terry. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks Amanda. And um, we will have uh, the opportunity for some Q&A um, after uh, the next couple of speakers. Um, so I'm hoping that Steve Warnham is online. Steve, there you Hi. are. Hi, good morning. Joining. Um, we can, uh, Steve is going to give us a, a short case study, if you like. Um, Steve is the MD of Road Safety Designs Limited. Um, this company has developed an LED warning triangle for drivers, which is marketed under the brand name of Bright Angle. And this has revolutionized uh, roadside safety. Just over three years ago, Steve took part in a Welsh Government mission to Australia, a, a physical mission, and was able to meet with a potential distributor. Things didn't quite go to plan eventually, but Steve is happy to share his experience. Um, so Steve, um, first of all, perhaps you could um, tell the group how you met with your potential um, distribution partner out in Australia? Yeah, we, um, before we went out, a number of meetings were actually set up, uh, but we also took part in uh, an event at the British Consul, I think it was, in, a, in an office on the 16th floor overlooking the harbour. A uh, fantastic place to be. Um, and during the event, there was a presentation by a shipping company uh, who just wanted to talk to us and um, say what they could do for us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we started talking to them and about our company, about our product, about what we wanted to do. And they actually said 
um, we do with a company that may be interested in your product and may be worth talking to. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize here, uh, that Amanda picked up on what we found over there that whoever we spoke to were really keen to help. Really genuinely interested in what we wanted to do. And this was not only the shipping company in um, in the office where we met in the consulate. It was also actually a street cleaner who looked at two very confused people who were lost in the middle of Sydney and came up to us and said, where do you want to go, mate? <laughs> and it was just it was just superb. Anyway, that's the side. So they said to us that um, one of the main people in the company was this particular gentleman who was going to be in Melbourne the following week. Uh, at a commercial vehicle show. Now, I'll be totally honest with you, the, the trade mission was for a week and we had, ten, a week, we had delayed our return flight so we could have a week's holiday in the Whitsunday Islands. We thought, let's treat ourselves, go all that way. Uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel that and we ended up at a commercial vehicle show in Melbourne. Um, we weren't over there for work, it was important. So we met this chap at a commercial vehicle show in Melbourne. He then introduced us to the chief exec of the Australian Caravanning Association, who they were both extremely keen on the product. They liked the product and they could certainly see the benefits of it for their members and their customers. Um, so, uh, yeah, bang went the holiday. And we ended up in Melbourne at a, at a conference center. So that's really where where the journey started with this particular company. Now, I, I know that um, that you received a, a fairly substantial first order from them. Um, something went wrong after that. Well, there was I've actually referred to it as the, the, the triple whammy, actually, because this was in probably mid 2019 um, and as soon as and this has nothing to do with our product, but as soon as the our product hit the shores, the the horrific bushfires hit. Um, so that stopped a vast majority of people from travelling. Uh, so that put one block on it. Then when that started to sort of ease a little bit, COVID hit. Again, people stopped travelling, um, and then. Uh, one of the another thing that hit us was the gentleman from the big distributor company who was our real keen supporter and backer. Um, he retired, and what happened was the the, the new broom that came in, let's say, um, didn't have the same focus on our particular product as as did Brad, who had retired. Um, we're still talking to them. We still see the they're in the leisure industry in in Australia. And we we certainly see because in the UK and Europe, we've had a fantastic response from the leisure industry, for instance, uh, with people who invested in motorhomes, caravans, that sort of thing, because this product is designed to keep you safe if for whatever, what, for whatever reason you find yourself, um, as the Department of Transport call it, an unplanned stoppage, or as we know, as a breakdown. So it's it's designed not just to keep the person who has broken down safe, but it's also designed for them to warn other road users of the that they are approaching a potential hazard and they will receive that warning from 300 metres away. So one of the things that Brad said to us and, and this other chap, Stuart, when we met in, in Melbourne, was they were chatting back and forth and Stuart actually picked up on the fact that one of the benefits of our product was for the um, I think they either call them grey nomads or silver nomads. I can't remember what they call them. The the people, i will say that my age who retired, they buy a, an RV and off they go for months on end. Whereas a lot of the places these people go, there's no roads, streetlights. So there are uh, horrific incidences where people have broken down in the in the outback, and there've been often days before they're found. With our product, he was saying they put it on top of the RV, it flashes and in pitch darkness, somebody can pick up from it for miles. So that's the industry we were going in. But as unfortunately with 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 Brad retiring, that did actually set us back a bit. So now we're we're looking to restart that process. 
And, and from the, the process that you went through before, Steve, what, what have you learned and what would you change maybe for, for next time? Um, one of the main things we would change would be the, um, the level of companies that we actually know want to target. Um, we, we made a, a bit of an error, I suppose, but it was a, a naive error of looking at retailers. Um, for instance, caravan accessory suppliers, big caravan dealerships. Um, and we've learned what COVID has allowed us to do is to sort of refocus this and say, well, actually, what we should be, the people we should be going for are the people who sell to these accessory products, because these retailers, they're not importers. They're not going to import an order off us in the number we want to import. So we need to look for the, um, the, the wholesalers who then will sell on to these smaller smaller companies because they will buy in bulk, they will get the bulk price and they will be able to filter the product out because they've got the customer base where, where we at the moment haven't. So that's one of the things we, we have really learned, which is why we're totally refocusing our, our target list for this upcoming um, virtual mission. So you, you've, you're joining the, the Welsh Government mission that's coming up? Yes, that's that's our end. That's what we would like to do. Um, and then it's it's then uh, totally refocusing. The, I've done a bit of research for the sort of companies that we think we would want to talk to. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. It's it's these are the sort of people we want to talk to. Yeah, and I think um, as we we've mentioned before um, with, with you, Steve, that it's being prepared for those discussions, isn't it? Really doing doing your homework, which I know is something uh, you've already done. Yeah, you? it is. As, as, as Amanda said, it, it's, 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 if you go into a meeting, whether it's a, it's a face to face meeting, it's a Zoom meeting or whatever, it's basically make sure that for, for us, it's make sure you've got all the facts there, or as, as, as many facts as you think you need. And this includes um, the shipping costs, for instance. What is the landed cost? Um, because it's a question that's going to come up. You can have your X works price and you say, well, this is the X works price. But what's more important is how much is it going to cost to my door? Um, and we've worked and we've developed a relationship with a local uh, logistics company that we can literally phone them up now or email them and say, right, we've used this for the states as well, that we want to, how much would it send to cost to send a pallet, sea freight or air freight from this address in Newport to this address in Oregon in Port, uh, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, or in or in Sydney or Melbourne, Australia, and then we request that they, that price that comes back, because they can do it, covers all the paperwork. You know, because we're not experienced in this, they are. So there's a very very small premium in a way to pay to get these professionals to say right, okay, and I get I get quotes back, and I can go back to the customer or sit with the customer and say, for my for my storage depot. To your front door, the unit cost is this, and I and, and as Manda said, it's it's that it's that forthrightness that that I love about dealing with the companies when we were on the visit. It's it's no um, no beating up the bush. It's, if there's a question to ask, is asked, and what yeah. they appreciate that we've learned is the answer, even if the answer is at the moment I don't know. To be honest, it's 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 as simple as that because. You will be sussed out. Yeah, I totally agree. But Steve, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I'm sure everyone um, resonates with uh, a lot of the points you've made and um, will bear them in mind as well. Um, so I'm going to hand back to um, Hugh Roberts now, who's going to talk about the free trade agreement. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, Terry, for that. Um, it's lovely to be here this morning and it's really nice actually to see some familiar faces on the screen that I haven't seen for a number of years anyway but um, a good morning to you anyway as as Terry has said my name is Hugh Roberts and I I work for the trade policy department within Welsh government and coincidentally as an aside 20 years of my private um, sector experience was working for two very large Australian companies both in the mining and manufacturing sectors 
So I've, I've got a, a long history with Australia, um, but I wanted to spend a few minutes this morning just outlining some of the economic relationships that Wales has with Australia. And I know um, Amanda provided some data earlier with regard to UK exports. My role within Welsh Government really is to look at the more granular element of things when it comes to what are the implications of free trade agreement for Wales, not only on the economic side of things, but, but on the wider scale of things. Um, so I'm just spending a couple of minutes this morning going over that with you. Um, obviously, you know, we, we're all aware that the UK government has, has um, you know, recently signed um, a free trade agreement with Australia. And this has come about really, just to give you a little bit of background, really, in terms of since us, you know, the UK leaving the European Union in 2020, UK government has begun negotiations on several trade agreements, obviously, to remove the, and or reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade, both to establish new agreements and to replace previous EU trade agreements also. So, you know, it's it's the world's the oyster, really, from, from that point of view since leaving the EU. But it is the UK government leading on this. Our role within that in terms of Welsh government in the trade policy team is, is, is in the interests of Wales and feeding into the UK government during the negotiations for um, the free trade agreements. Um, to date, the UK government has signed three new agreements, Australia being one. It's renegotiated one, um, an existing one with uh, Japan. Um, the agreements with Australia were signed in December 2021, and um, and there's one with New Zealand, which was signed in February 2022 uh, this year, and a digital trade agreement with Singapore. Um, it's important to mention that Australia is also a member of what they call the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's CPTPP. It only took me three months to um, perfect. Um, which is a trading block with 11 countries, really. And that negotiation is going on at the moment. Um, so that's a little bit of background a bit in terms about the free trade agreement and what's going on at the moment. Nick, if we can go on to the, um, just go on to the infographic element that I've put on there. Um, thanks a lot. I, what I've tried to do really in terms of one slide <laughs> is to give you the sort of economic sort of relationships that, that Wales has with Australia anyway. So let's have a little look to see what um, see what we've got here anyway. So um, the one page infographic that, I, that I've got here looks at the exports and imports between Wales and Australia, along with the key sectors. So you can have a look at that. I won't dwell on it. It's something that I'm sure you've got access to the presentation. Um, but it just gives you the highlights in terms of what we export from Wales and what we import from, from Australia to Wales anyway. Uh, the UK's government own analysis has found that Wales could see an increase in the gross value added to the sum of around £58 million. Pounds. Um, so that's really encouraging. So the removal or reduction in tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade will obviously increase the flow of of industrial goods between Australia and Wales, but also assist service providers. And this clearly comes out from the free trade agreement is the service element. And Amanda obviously highlighted these earlier in terms of some of the digital trade um, areas that, that have got brilliant opportunities and also government contracts we can bid for. Um, and also the business visa elements, if you're sending somebody out there um, you know, to support a contract that's made far easier for you uh, moving forward. Um, there's also a very firm commitment in having a simpler and more transparent customs procedure to make things easier for you as watch companies also. Um, so, you know, I won't go into a lot of the granular elements of what the free trade agreement would be for you. But as individual companies, you know, You've got the support of, of Welsh Government um, to look at the intricacies of what you have in terms of whether it's a product or a service, looking at how, how that impacts in terms of the free trade agreement 
um, structure and, and how that applies to you as a Welsh company. And I know that Welsh Government have got the the services to and programmes to support you on those fronts anyway. I don't, I, I want to emphasise, um, I don't think there's a better time for you to look at the Australian market, if I'm really honest. With the free trade coming in, um, the the appetite that that um, the Australian um, have have got for for UK products and services is is increasing, so that's really encouraging. I think having the support of of going on a virtual mission to Australia gives you the opportunity to start discussions with interested parties out there, but also finding the route that you require to take advantage of exploring the market and taking advantage of some of the great um, benefits of the free trade agreement that we've got anyway. Um, I think there's a question there from Owain. Um, sorry, let me just have a little look at it again. In terms of when they start, there's there's a couple of areas um, that have to go through both the Australian and the UK government. Um, that's got to go in front of Parliament to be signed off completely, and that's going to happen in the in the coming months anyway. So, uh, you know, by the time you've explored the market and that you get it, you know, you get in and you find your partners in the market, you know, that that'll be sort of up and running then. There are, I need to stress also that certain areas of a free trade agreement are not standardised across the board. In certain sectors, there is a time lapse in terms of some of the um, the sort of trade uh, rules. And that's done for certain reasons, whether they're strong sectors within markets or whatever. But what I would say is the specifics of your products, your services really talk to to uh, trigger and his colleagues within the trade team when you're looking at the services and providers and they can work with you to to sort of develop that knowledge in the market so that you know that but you know it's it's a formality now um Owen in terms of your question in terms of when those come in anyway um I, w I won't dwell on any more as I said I think this is a great opportunity and a you know great timing for you to start looking at the market anyway and I would encourage you to um, you know, to sort of enrol on the on the virtual trade mission. And good luck to you all anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, all of our contributors um, and presenters. Um, we, we have got a, a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, I was doing my best to um, respond to uh, Owen's question. Um, so I, I'll perhaps uh, explain that to the whole group. Um, I'm guessing everybody knows there's a chat function, which is on the top bar, an icon there, so you can read what's going on. Um, my past experience in logistics, um, the question was, uh, how are the rates changing in terms of shipping rates from UK to Australia. Uh, there has, I believe, always been an imbalance so that we take a lot of product from Australia to the UK. But one of my roles when working for NYK was getting empty boxes back to somewhere where they could be filled and be productive and make money. So um, if you're on the leg where they need boxes returning to a particular area, um, then you can be quite bullish and press the rates down. So that's a, a conversation worth having. I've even known people to give a you give you a credit, so they will pay you to ship with them, simply to uh, reposition a TU or or, or a box. Um, uh, in, in terms of rates, I, I, I think particularly with with China, they've gone up ten, twenty fold, up to um, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Um, from rates that were far, far lower. Um, obviously, with the factory shutdowns at present, that's more difficult to predict. Uh, as I understand it, um, an, an interesting thing about Australia, we, we had a delegation come over to, to London some years back. Um, but I, as I understand it, Australia has a free trade agreement with um, China and other areas within Asia. So, 
it's conceivable that maybe for Welsh companies to get your goods to some of the Asian markets, um, a transshipment route via Australia would permit you some sort of access that is presently not available in terms of free trade agreements. Um, I don't know whether, uh, Amanda, you could expand on that and how we can take advantage of those free trade agreements that Australia has as Welsh exporters. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Trick. No, it's a good point. And um, it, it would probably depend on the content that was manufactured in Australia and the different agreements. But just to kick off, there's probably, I think there's 19 or something free trade agreements Australia has with different countries. So um, over the past 15 years, so uh, yeah, the, there's definitely scope for that depending on what you're doing with that product in Australia. Yeah. Sorry, can you mind if I jump in and just chip in? And in terms of the rules of origin as well, we have to bear in mind specific right. products that you know um, going from here to Australia on to onwards. There would be there would be um, you know you'd have to consider that anyway within within what you're doing. Thank you, Hugh. Um, with regards to um, IP. Um, I think I, I'll defer to Amanda again, but you, you did mention that it was important to register um, presumably your, your trademark and your, in your patents in market as well. That's absolutely right. Yeah, so um, it's it's a developed market, but like anything, if you've invested in R and D and or a brand or a trademark, um, it's very much encouraged to to register it in Australia, which has a global impact as well. So, um, I, I think the question was also to Steve around what he did. I think he he might have interesting answers whether he registered his product in Australia before he did business there. Yeah, we we. Um... We registered our uh, application in, in a number of countries and then you sort of narrow it down to where you go, the markets you actually want to work in. And with Australia and, and New Zealand, actually, we looked at it and we saw the potential in the market. So we've got our trademark and trade name registered in both markets. And we have a um, some protection on our products as well. Um, my understanding is if, and this is the way it was explained to me, if somebody, if it was copied, if our product was copied and then sent into Australia, for instance, under the bright angled name, we could, where we might not be able to get hold of the manufacturer, we could certainly go after the importer and the seller. That was my understanding, which is why the importance of protecting the, the trademark and trade name so nobody could could sell nobody could manufacture in another country and sell a bright angle warning truck LED warning triangle in Australia that was my understanding so which is why the importance of getting the trademark and trade name registered it's a long process it's not the cheapest thing but in the long run it's, it's you need to do it And I think after the presentations and the questions we've received, um, part of the purpose of this session is to prepare people ahead of the trade mission for the region. Um, if Nick, you could kindly put the details up on the screen um, so that people can factor into this, um, their market selection and their, their overseas planning. So perhaps a, a, an advantage now we we all appreciate with um, COVID and remote working is, is that we can um, <clears throat> investigate certain markets without necessarily um, the restrictive time commitment um, and that being driven by um, events and itineraries that, that don't necessarily fit in with, with your schedule. Um, so we do have this excellent example we can look at a test market, as we've explained in presentations. We also know that it's a relatively familiar market to us in the UK. Um, and the style of doing business um, is one that we're also familiar with, with 
established e-commerce um, and you've got that market concentration with it within the larger cities so um, we, we'd very much encourage people to to join the the, the mission um, it, it is also an opportunity perhaps to experiment with this market make your investigations prior then to joining a, a physical mission in the future um, or if you recall um, I think most of us are experienced with Welsh Government services looking at the people on the call and we do have the overseas business development visit service as well which can support um, trips into market so with without any further questions um, I see Ruth has just joined um, with a question of course Nick will send out the links to the recording and the slides um, uh, there's a question there from Ben if you're able to um, to answer that Amanda in, in terms of the relationship with China please yeah, sure. Look, it's a good question. Um, I'd say to an extent, um, there's a lot of inter interdependence between Australia and China, but it's not completely reliant on China. So it's obviously a major um, purchaser of commodities, which are improving our balance of payment. And um, commodity prices have been very good, which has been very good for the economy. Um, China is also a major supplier of uh, manufactured items into Australia. So there are certain industries that are hinged very closely to China. But in recent years or a couple of years during the pandemic, I think people have realised they need to diversify their sources of, uh, of manufactured items from China. And I think that's a plus for European companies and for Welsh companies in particular to make that that point of difference that you're an alternative to an Asian market. Um, given the ups and downs of that trading relationship so so yes very interconnected not hot let's not hope we're wholly dependent uh but very critical relationship yeah and ben was also asking about the levels of disposable income which i, I believe are as i saw it comparable with with the uk i don't know about the local income tax rates whether that has any bearing I don't know exactly the figures, I'd have to look them up, but there's, there was a phenomena during COVID where people didn't spend any money. And so there was this uh, news reporting that people had a lot more disposable income because they weren't travelling to the office, they weren't taking international holidays. And then now that income is coming out, they're spending it on caravans to tour Australia, you know, expensive uh, bicycles for their kids, you know, things things like that, that maybe they didn't do, uh, or their, their behaviour has changed as a result of a lot of, a long time in lockdown. Some cities had many, many days and months in lockdown. So I think there's been a bit of a reaction to that, which has meant people might go out and spend more money on, on a, you know, a high-end restaurant or a holiday internationally that they wouldn't have done. So uh, whether that continues or not is another is another question because there's such a high cost of um, living and inflation hasn't really been passed on to the consumer yet in many industries. And it, it makes me think of a question for myself, Amanda. Um, uh, I mean, because of the, the potentially harsh and different conditions because of the size of the country. I mean, is staycation very much a thing that's developed and will probably be there to stay for Australia yeah, that, or the really likes of Fifth Wheel and the suppliers to outdoor leisure that we have in yeah. Wales? Absolutely. There's been a real rise in, in people who are purchasing recreational type of equipment, boats and going out and, and even different generations. So um, Steve mentioned the, the grey nomads who retire and buy the caravan and tour Australia. That's very much um, increased post COVID um, because people can't travel internationally, but it's also younger people as well. So people in their 30s and 40s are taking a year off work and they're now doing that, ex having that experience of, of rec more recreational activity. So very much uh, on, on topic, very much in you know, a phenomena that's being experienced in Australia at the moment. Everyone goes camping, everyone you know, owns tents, um, everyone loves, you know, all, all that sort of outdoor stuff. So, and it's it's even um, it's even evident in things like drowning, like which is not a very nice topic to talk about. But there's more river and coastal drowning as a result of people doing more recreational activity. So um, those statistics in terms of public health have have shifted as well. So, 
Thank you, Amanda. And, and just to say that the sooner you sign up for the uh, Australian virtual mission, the sooner um, Terry and, and her experts and colleagues can contribute and and plan for your for your visits and your introductions. So um, I don't believe we have any further questions. So may I say thank you to all of the speakers this morning, and particular thanks to the, the companies who have joined. Um, and please, we, we look forward to you signing up for the mission. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye, everyone. Bye. I'm just going to stay on Nick for a minute or two, if that's okay.